We're very happy to welcome Joy Mountford and Melissa Gitter, who were two of the team that did the studies that are going to be reported on this evening. And their third colleague is not available this evening, unfortunately, Cheng Chao Zhu, but you may be in touch with him separately. Uh, what was I going to say? I wanted to show, I wanted to read for myself. Ah, yes. So Joy is marking her fifth occasion presenting to Bay Kai, the first one being in 1995. And she asked, where, where do art and science meet? That sounds, and you were at interval at that time, Joy. And then you actually, the following month, Richard Anderson, you remember Richard Anderson, he's the topic of our next meeting. He interviewed you on February 14th in 95. I don't know if we have a recording of that meeting. Uh, you then, Joy, showed up again on September of 2004, where we talked about what interaction designers ought to learn about design. And you also helped us uh, with the discussion of visualizations for our collective lives in November of 2009, but that was quite a long time ago. And I'm so I'm extremely delighted to welcome you once again to Bake High, and I will stop sharing and I will let you two take over and tell us your story. Now, often we like to um, uh, have people darken their screen, you know, or turn their video off. And then I think that we won't be interrupting uh, the screen with until the discussion period, right? Joy, Melissa, please take it away. Thank you, Nancy. It's great to be back. Um, I am still alive, as you point out, which is a great um, thing to know, because since 2009, a lot has happened, especially in interaction design and in my career. I didn't mean to be gone that long, but I'm glad to be back. I also would love to try and encourage some new young people like Melissa next to me and others. Chen Shao is actually on a plane. He would love to be here too and is often near me. Both uh, Chen Shao and myself work at SAP now and Melissa works at Calibri. Calibra. Sorry. <laughs> okay. okay, and it's good that she can interrupt, which I hope other people will do during the course of this conversation, which uh, we hope will be interactive. So I'm going to try and uh, position this as something I find quite disturbing for the interface community, which is that uh, we don't think a lot about people who have different abilities. We call them disabilities. Sorry, I'm trying to find out how to go. I'll, I'll do right, it. Okay. So once upon a time, about 10 days ago, I bumped into Ted Zelka, which I very rarely do, uh, at a party, which I very rarely do. And probably I should never do this because every time I seem to go out of my house, I get another assignment. And he said, we've lost our speaker for next week. Can you do it? So I said, well, I could not being super enthusiastic, but I, he said, well, you can come up with something, right? So I said, sure, you know. So the topics we vaguely discussed was the future of design education, how to innovate in corporations and AI. And when I got back um, to my uh, computer later in the day, we decided that we would do haptics and the phone interface because it's actually a case study, let's say. And I felt that was more uh, useful for many more people and also includes audio, which I've been a big fan of ever since I was at Apple. So we wanted to include these comments now that when we get to the question and answer time, I'm happy to try and include some of these. I wanted you to also know that the design um, of the future of design education special um, issue edited by Jing Mao has just come out in the last, um, I think, 10 days. Uh, it's 44 different of your favorite authors in the commun community of Kai who've written what we believe is a so-called definitive um, commentary on what we need to see design education include. So it's been going on for uh, Meredith Davis is the one of the key people that brought us all together. And it's, I think it was about two years worth of work. And I have a chapter in it with um, uh, Dietmar and 
Oh, I forgot I had to say his last name, but anyway, he's from Northeastern University, and we're looking at how to use audio and other modalities, which is sort of a passionate topic of mine, which we'll try and include today. So thank you. So one of the things that I feel at the moment is we're always in a crisis, not just politically or in climate, but especially when we look at where we are in our life, we're all getting older. But what we're doing is we're getting older with less abilities. I know we use the word disability, but we're getting less able to see or hear or be able to touch. And so that means obviously we've got different health issues in general. I think the big problem here is that we think about US and the data that's around is even worse in an international situation, especially for blindness because they don't have the surgeries for cataracts or various other forms of uh, blindness that children are born with, especially in Africa. Uh, just think, you know, 30 million people in America are so-called um, visually impaired, and there's lots of definitions of what visually impaired means. But then think about people not being able to hear, especially if you consider now that we're dealing with AVs and cars are not, um, you know, making the same sorts of noises, so we're now also the hearing people are impaired because we can't rely on our hearing. Now, then we get to something like physical touch. There's lots of different types of touch. And I think that's an area that people need to be aware of when they talk about perception and they don't decide, discuss how touch is a part of our everyday world. Um, and then as we all get older, um, we have different ailments through slip discs or strokes or neuro disabilities. Now, I don't even want to consider what the costs are of all those combined disabilities or lack of abilities, but just visual issues for older people are $3 billion a year. And that's just in America. Um, I just want to, I'm not going to explain these charts because everyone can go on to CDC networks network and look at the numbers. What I found interesting about this graph, as we get older, of course, things get worse. Nothing goes up, it all goes down, okay? And the thing that's interesting to me on that on this graph is that I would have thought that um, different parts of our body uh, would go down at the same rate, and they don't. And the other thing that I was surprised about here is that um, the, the um, finger has the less um, sensitivity then our cheek and our forearms and our shoulders, which I thought was quite interesting because I always think of my fingertip uh, as being very sensitive, but the cheek is way up there. So it doesn't mean very much in our particular situation now, but think about the rest of our body as being part of the sen sensory um, habit or um, let's say costume that we can use in the future to design for which includes the potential for clothes or fabrics to be used with our, on our body as part of the complexion that we should be able to design with and for. Next one here is visual disabilities. Again, the same graph, it doesn't matter what the metrics are, it's going down. But particularly look at the steepness after 18. After 18 years old, it's getting doubly worse and even after 60, it gets even more doubly worse. So people are wandering around basically in a fog, in a cloud. And we really do need to address these to help get our sensory interfaces designed better. So what is in addition to this is very, very surprising to me that almost nobody does um, multi-modality research. I'm frankly sick and tired of reading resumes that tell me how graphically competent students are and see nothing at all written about their ability to, for, to design for audio or um, sound or anything like that. So they really don't have any modality experience except vision. So for example, you know, Negroponte used to say about 20 years ago, if you want to improve the quality of your visual TV, uh, perceived television quality, improve the quality of the audio. That's been known for ages. So without improving the quality of the television, just improve the visuals, sorry, the audio, and people will believe the television is better visually. 
So the other thing that I find interesting is we don't look at the, how information in a sensory capacity can be disambiguated when you add another sense. So anytime you use vision or audition or touch and audition, they help you resolve what the actual stimulus is that you're seeing. And I think people have not done very much research in this at all. Hopefully now we're getting more capabilities in the world of tactileness that we might be able to do more work with this. And if you look at just things like a fingertip, not a finger, but there's 3000 touch receptors just in a, a fingertip, which is an enormous number to think about how to use that. And they're mostly all configured to look at pressure. So when you think about when you press a button, how many receptors are being um, fired at one time, it's an enormous number. When you go to the garage and you try and tell your mechanic what's wrong with your car, I think probably we've all had that experience where you have to describe the defect in a sound. You say, my car does and it doesn't do whoop, or it should go whoop. So the use of audio and even the vibration in cars is key to being able to differentiate within other people's cars what's wrong with yours and get it fixed. And the other thing is that I don't know if you realize this, but vibration is not um, linear. So it's very, very um, not sensitive to amplitude when it gets above a certain amplitude. So although we're designing sensors now with you know, vibration in them, it's very sensitive at the beginning, but when it gets too big, it doesn't continue to be sensed quite the same way as it does when it's at the lower ends of amplitude. I looked at a lot of research in the last couple of months because I've been interested in why international students are so much better, in my opinion, than American students. And they're doing very creative research in the multimodal sensory space. So cheering on international students here. I'm hopeful a little bit, although that's not terribly encouraging, but I do have to say that there's been some interesting work beginning now in the metaverse and it's all because it's fashionable, therefore it's hot. And it also medical progress is working very hard in de developing skin light, wireless haptic interfaces like skins that can be applied to um, other objects, but also on top of your skin. A lot of the training areas are for VR and AR, but they're also trying to help people get better with sports and also learn how to do remote surgeries and thing like that, things like that. Two particular pieces of research I find interesting is the liquid metal uh, elastometers that are being encapsulated in stretchable skins to be again put on top of um, prosthesis, but also for actual skin to be on top of your uh, palms or on your fingertips. There's another one in, um, I think it's Hong Kong, called WeTac skin that's being integrated into uh, prosthetic forearms with various um, Bluetooth sensors that can use them remotely. And they're only one millimeter thick, which is really a big breakthrough. Um, I think this is the end of what I wanted to say about alerting us to the real need for more kind of what I call research and students to have their eyes opened about more audio and more tactile work to be added to their um, portfolio. For example, Splice is a great tool that I've almost seen no students know much about, which is a set of audio tools that they can use routinely, very much fun as well to use. So we uh, worked, Ford worked with um, funding, very small amount of funding for an organization called Vista, which is down the road here in Palo Alto. And I have to tell you, they have the greatest attitude of people I've ever worked with. Um, when I went to the conference and gave a similar paper that Melissa will give, um, they were the only people at a conference I saw their faces looking up at me. I'm so tired of going to conferences, everybody's hand is looking down at their iPhone or something. Their faces were looking up, paying attention. Although they couldn't see me, they wanted to look up and look at me, which I find fascinating. They also learn very fast, way faster than I think I do but they have very limited tools and they're so eager to accommodate. What I also note it was that they can hear so well. So when you drop a coin, for example, they can tell whether it's a, a quarter or a, you know, the dime just by the sound that it 
uh, offers when it drops onto the floor. So um, the audio design is very, very limited. I forgot what I was going to say here. So let's just move on. <laughs> um, I think I remember uh, basically audio, audio design seems to be like a, a an obvious fix for a lot of the blind and visually impaired, but oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's really untouched in terms yeah. of all of their apps. That most of yeah. the apps they have rely on like the iPhones yeah. um, text to speech functions. Yeah, it's surprisingly not specific to them. It's just a generic capability for all of us, which it should be. Mm -hmm. But you would think it would have a special set of features that were accommodating their needs. So just moving forward into current solutions. I have been at the airport, which I'm sure you all have. And we've all seen the standard Prius arrive that's usually the same color. And we can't read the license plate because it's raining. And it's the same color as all the other cars. They do have that little pill that sometimes shows a color, but you can't tell what car, and especially if it doesn't have a number plate on the front of the car or the back of the car as well. Some states don't require that, and it's just a nightmare, including now that the you can't tell the car noise as much as you used to be able to. Now they're all EVs, etc. And it turns out when you talk to the blind people, they end up having to scream, the driver has to scream out of the window because they're usually on the opposite side of the car yelling people's names, which seems a little bit primitive in our era of technology now. So I think that we learn ourselves how to identify using the flashlight on our phone, et cetera, to read a number plate, but it's pretty ridiculously low tech. Um, I recently, one of my uh, peers here said that they thought the um, Tesla was great because it opened the door for you. It doesn't actually open the door, it tells it bleeps, but the door doesn't actually open. You then have to fumble with the door handle to even open the door in a Tesla. So we have technologies that are not actually fixing or closing the actual use case problem. So in addition, this is for us being actually visually capable. Now imagine the situation when somebody is impaired visually. It's a nightmare. Over to Melissa, because she's going to tell you the case study that we did all together three years ago, just to point out that this was before we had as good technology as we do now. Right. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about blind or visually impaired people. And as you can imagine, there's a spectrum. There's people who've been born blind, and they're different from people who've been sighted and then developed some sort of medical illness or where it's in some accident and then lost their sight afterward. Um, so there's a spectrum here. Um, they use their voiceover function on the iPhone on a daily basis. iPhone has a superior, the, the, the superior capabilities currently, and some of them understand audio playback at 180% playback speed. So I don't know if you've ever, you know, um, changed the speed on a YouTube video, but they do that all the time. They rely on that audio. The voiceover works well for existing rideshare apps, but there are still a lot of challenges when it comes to actually physically finding the vehicle and then physically finding the building once they've exited the vehicle. Um, visually impaired people rely on hearing to find objects. So some it was interesting watching them um, come into the room where we were having a study because uh, we were instructed by um, the, the front desk workers to help the people by literally standing up and saying, this is your chair. And this is the table and actually hitting the chair and the table physically to make a sound so that the that our so that our visually impaired users could understand and get a bearing of the room. As we said, the problem is that the main problem that we identified while we were at Ford was that finding your vehicle is difficult and stressful, um, and especially so for the blind and visually impaired. So how do we go about um, actually changing that? To make our solution valid, we had to know a lot of things about um, the blind and visually impaired people. What assistive technologies do they use? Do they have experience with haptic feedback? Is that a daily activity? What are the other pain points encountered in a ride hail service? What are how do they activate it? How, what is a non-visual interface? A lot of a lot of us, unless you know someone personally who is actually activated a lot of these accessibility features on on their phone, like you don't know 
what the interface looks like. You don't know how to interact with it. Um, and then finally, what technologies can work in a real vehicle. The timeline was pretty quick. Um, we did research on the technology at first, and then we were finally able to visit the VISTA Center and actually conduct user research for some initial um, just findings, and then eventually go back and actually share the first and um, second prototype as well. And Joy mentioned we went to a conference and shared more about that. So just to be clear, this is about um, four months long from the beginning to end, or six months, sorry, six months long. So I think that was, we specifically did it fast, because in fact, I think Chen Xiao was going back office on internship so we had to hurry up and get it done <laughs> yeah yeah um the study process uh we mentioned this vista center for the um blind and visually impaired they are a nonprofit that helps educate this group of individuals on what's what resources and tools are available to them and so they're especially helpful when when someone is either you know They've been blind their whole life and they're trying to step out into the world, or maybe they've been in a major accident and now they're trying to grapple with this new life that they found themselves in. Um, so uh, we managed to narrow it, uh, our participants down to a group of six people, and then we were able to bring back those people um, for a user test and then iterate on that. The first thing was to actually find those six people. So we sent out a survey monkey, and it, you would be in, it's interesting to know they that survey monkey works really well with voiceover features. So it's a very accessible option for the blind and visually impaired. We were looking for three men and three women, any range of age, that they use Ride Hill service and they have a range of visual ability. So um, as you can imagine, not everyone uses a ride hail service. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a scary thing. I don't know if even us, you know, that we would be willing to go out and even put a blindfold around our eyes and actually try to find a ride, a ride hail ride um, the way that they do it. So that's what we did. We met in a room with them um, and we had a rain. The, the youngest participant was 23. Um, and the oldest was over 50, and two of them used guide dogs, which was important to the feedback and experiences of, of the Ride Hill um, app, because a lot of, we found out that a lot of drivers actually would leave. They would, they would see the guide dog, and they would leave um, the, these, these people stranded, and I think one woman sued Uber for like a million dollars, um, and it was in the news. Anyway, um, we held the focus group, um, wanted to know about their pain points and really understand what their experience was. Um, and because, you know, there's all of these techniques in the user research um, community, but we were working with people who couldn't see or had some of them could see, but, you know, only up in front of their face. And so what we used instead of, you know, emojis, you'd place a happy emoji here, or a sad emoji here, we just used their thumbs. So we would count down and is it a good experience, neutral experience, or is it a bad experience? And that ended up being really effective um, way of getting their feedback. And so there's a lot of different var uh, variables, which we'd mentioned. There's the range of sightedness. There's age differences. Um, if they have a guide dog, a backpack, and a walking stick, um, it can be very complicated to get in and out of a car, especially when Lyft and Uber drivers are like on the clock and they're trying to make money. Um, also, we learned that if some of the uh, people are diabetic, that can also affect their sensitivity to haptic feedback on a phone. We also learned that they see the walking stick as an extension of themselves, which is, which is important given the physical nature of what we were trying to do. We were trying to help them find the car, but as soon as their, their walking stick would touch something, then they considered themselves there, even if, technically speaking, it was three feet ahead of them, if that makes sense. Um, so in terms of the tech that was available to us at the time, uh, we we did some change how I should say did some research on what would be the best technology to prototype this in um, Bluetooth, um, which we decided was the ideal for actually making the 
uh, interaction work, but um, there were some challenges with that. Uh, radar is great for autonomous vehicles when they're driving, um, but it's too long range for us. Uh, also LIDAR, um, but Connect ended up being our first prototype um, because that was what we could, what Cheng Chao could work with in the, the short range of time that he had. And the prototype system, um, <laughs> I'll do my best since Cheng Chao's not here, but basically um, he used, even, even though iPhone um, was the best um, at, at haptic uh, or, or just like voiceover technology, it was actually more difficult to prototype with it because of all the permissions and security around Apple. And so Cheng Chao was using um, an Android phone and he was using uh, the, uh, the sensor data from the Android to connect to the web application and the HTTP server to then communicate with the Connect how far away um, the phone was, and that the, then the phone could tr be triggered um, to play different. Um. So this was an interim uh, idea. We didn't think this would be the ultimate solution, but we wanted to test it out so that we could do a experiment, as it were, in a close range because this would work for them, and then we'd do another prototype. Mm -hmm. So we knew this was temporary. Yes. Ultra wideband triangulation. So what was also something that stood out to us during the user research was the participants said not only was it difficult to find the car, especially on a busy street, because imagine you're, you're listening for any vehicle to pull up, you're listening for engine noise, but then you don't know where the car door is. Um, and they dis the, the participants described literally feeling along the door, and you know, if we're being honest, we don't wash our cars as often as we probably should, and so they're getting their hands dirty trying to find the door, uh, the car door handle, and so we realize it's important not just to lead them to the correct car, but lead them to the point of entry, um, which is usually the back seat. So, we used two anchors, uh, or this is the proposal. These are images from the patent that we submitted. But we proposed having two anchors, the front and the back of the vehicle, and use that to triangulate the exact location um, where the phone should lead um, the visually impaired person. So the phone has the tag in it already, and then that sends a signal about how close you're going towards the car, triangulating it to move you further left, right, and also move forward back. Yes. And forward. I mean, I played the hot and cold game as a child all the time. This is very similar, except instead of saying hot or cold or hotter or colder, warmer, warmer, cooler, cooler, it's saying the same thing, but using the vibration of the phone and also the audio um, feedback. And it's a pulsing audio that gets faster and faster, slower, slower. Mm -hmm. And we'll play some of that for you in a minute. Uh, in a minute. <laughs> And so uh, we got to get the person at the correct car. And what was very um, hopeful about this situation was also because if the car is already knowing where the phone is, when the user enters the car, um, the, the car, the AV, you know, in this situation would know that the user has entered the vehicle. And so there you know, we always talk about how when you when you design for the for accessibility, you actually make the experience better for everyone. Um, the initial prototype focused on the four states. The feature is on. How do the people know that the phone is pointed in the correct directions because it's doing directionality um, and walking closer to the car and the car door is right in front of you. So one thing that we did notice, by the way, is that they have to know if they can sit down. So there may be someone else actually in the car, first of all. And the other thing is the dog might be sitting somewhere. Now they can usually feel the dog, but the point is that they have to know whether they're going to step over or just sit immediately where there's space. These are very important, subtle distinctions because they don't want to look silly or sit on someone's lap. <laughs> They've actually, they did describe they had actually had to accidentally done without using this. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So this is a picture of the room we were in. That's Cheng Chao. Hi, Cheng Chao. Um, and this is our participant. And there's a connect, which you can't see. It's just off camera. And um, John is looking at, uh, he's feeling the vibrations of the phone 
and testing um, the prototype. So what we learned from the prototype was that we need to add more contrast between wrong and right directions. Um, we need to increase vibration speed and just have a longer vibration um, for different points so that's very clear to users what's happening. We needed the first prototype only had vibrations. And so the um, like Joy said earlier, we our, um, our ability to understand what's going around uh, us increases when there's two senses that we're using, not just touch, but also hearing. And a lot of uh, these users, they'll have one, um, they'll have one um, ear earbud in their ear, one out so that they can hear what's going on outside, but then one plugged into their phone so they're not disturbing anyone else with the voiceover function in their car. And then the ability to automatically activate the feature and then deactivate when it's so. I'm going to play this video for you. Um, I need to explain why the phone is on the stool. It's because we were trying to figure out how to convey vibration <laughs> when you, you're, you, the watcher of this video, are not actually holding the phone in your hand. And so the vibration is a little bit awful to listen to, but I think you'll get the point. So we're using the, ch the, ch the little stool as an amplifier. Yes. <laughs> so it's, it sounds ridiculous because it is ridiculous for you to hear, but it does not sound like this when someone's actually got it in their hand. Okay. You can't hear anything. It, it's just right. you're, you're, you're experiencing the senses. So yeah, it, it was, we had to some fun times <laughs> trying to, to have meetings with in Michigan across right. the phone. But anyway, feature is on. So question, can you hear that? Someone needs to... Coming off answer. mute, yes. <laughs> okay. I had to come off mute. Yep, we can hear it. Very, okay. very low. Okay, feature is on, and now the user is um, figuring out whether they're pointing in the correct direction with their phone. So, so that... Go ahead. So the phone is literally doing the direction the directionality of the phone is like this. This is how our GPS works too. So you notice if you like turn, then the little arrow on your Google Maps or your Apple Maps will move in the direction that it thinks that you're going. This was also interesting. I remember Cheng Chao doing a lot of research on minor versus major keys um, to in figuring out what combination of that would work as an audio. So what's interesting here is you probably, I don't know if you can hear, it's going also going down in pitch and up in pitch, okay? So we are assuming that down is not good to a certain degree and up is better, right? Now you can say, well, how do I know what, you know, it's, it's not clear to me immediately. Completely agree. However, if you do it a few times, it's immediately clear, right? Many audio things you need to just experience a couple of times and then you get it. And we're not expecting you to get it at this point in this Beikai talk, but when you do it a few times and you also get the vibration, it becomes a complete experience that you can understand. And so when our participants have found the correct direction, then an additional, um, the, the, the vibration changes a little bit and it starts beeping as like a, a, a almost an, a, a vibrating beacon um, towards the direction of the vehicle. It's getting faster and also yes, so um, more resonant. Sorry. 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 And yes, it explodes when you arrive. <laughs> the joke, okay. I'm sorry for laughing. It, it just sounds so much worse than yeah, the, yeah. the actual experience, yeah. but thank you for bearing with us. 
Um, here are some quotes I would like to play, and you can also start to see the mannerisms of these different people. So this is John, and he was he was born um, completely blind. He can see a little bit of light, um, but that's all. I think it could be really helpful, and um, and and especially with autonomous vehicles. I mean, it's going to be. Um, you know, I, I ask myself, okay, do you think there will really come a day when you'll feel comfortable riding in an autonomous vehicle with nobody, nobody at the controls, it, no human being in the vehicle with you? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of a scary thought on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's, it's sort of exhilarating. I mean, it's kind of like, wow, you know, this technology could really be, could really be something. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's interesting that, uh, Someone who's blind, in other words, he's basically, if you like, in the dark, is scared of getting in the dark in a car with someone who's in the dark to ride as normally in the dark, right? But for us, we are scared for completely different reasons because we're not in the dark. We can see what the car's doing. But he, even he is scared of an autonomous vehicle. I found that very um, intriguing that he would feel that way. Yeah. And then um, this individual, you'll be able to tell he was actually sighted at one point and then he started to lose his vision. So he knows how to make eye contact and he's aware of just the social mannerisms that we have, but he in fact can't see very far. He actually has to hold his phone up to his face like this in order to see. I mean, what I mean by universal application is, yeah, we're looking locating the car there, but suppose I mean, anything like if, if I mean, I don't know how what the receiving end of it is, mm -hmm. but whatever that receiving end is, suppose, I mean, I'm, I'm just for example, in the house, we want to know where the microwave is, right? I mean, again, I know where that is, but, or suppose every time I walk to this Vista Center, I'm always like, oh man, where did the door go? So if there's a receiving end on it, mm -hmm. it'd be cool. But again, that'd be like, you know, millions of receiving and mm -hmm. so I don't know yeah. I don't know what's on the car yeah. and how you mass yeah. produce that, you know. Right. But long story short, what I'm trying to say is it could be done for guiding me anywhere and you just program you yeah. know your top ten things. Yeah. That'd be kinda cool. Mm. So yeah. and this is when we knew that we had hit something good because our participant was even saying he wanted this to be outside of the autonomous vehicle experience because it worked so well just even in the prototype for him. He wanted it for entering buildings and finding microwaves and finding things that he uses all the time. So I think that's a very good example of almost the internet of things or the internet of everything or everywhere, because it was almost as universally perceived as something that I'd like to be able to walk around like with this uh, almost the um, metal detecting kind of life where you could see what's around you. And I thought that was very endearing and very prescient of him. Mm -hmm. Yes. So other key quotes were uh, our participants wished that drivers were more considerate of their needs. They just need more time to get their bearings, understand their situation, get settled, especially if they have a guide dog. Um, what appealed to them about the AV is that the AV doesn't care how much time um, that they would take and they would feel much more safe in that environment. Um, and it was it was really meaningful. Uh, for them to feel like we were actually working on a project that could really make a difference in their lives. So in terms of next steps, um, it would have, it would be to actually port this software to the iPhone. So I mentioned that uh, for the purposes of our prototype, we, we uh, Cheng Chao prototyped on an Android, but the next step would to be doing it on iPhone and actually use the ultra wideband technology available on the iPhone um, to prototype into that and then do more user testing on it. So we actually know that there is a, um, well, at that point, we knew there was an SDK for the iPhone. So we had actually got access to that and we were hoping to start on that next phase before they, of course, closed that particular department at Ford. So and that's why COVID happened. Oh, happened? Oh, yeah. and, and that happened too, yeah. <laughs> so we did actually hear like know, 10 days ago or something that the patent application was allowed. And so we'll see what Ford will do if they decide to work on anything like this further. So I'm sorry, I cut you off a bit there at the end. No, so it was, was a it. very nice relationship and we enjoyed it. It was reasonably 
um, insightful, bad pun um, for us to work on this together. Um, I think it was a really good internship type of program. I know Chen Chao is not here, but I know it was one of the things he enjoyed the most that he'd work on in his career. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and I love Janet's comment too. Um, Sorry, I can't see that oh. far because I'm visually <laughs> not challenged. Let's put she, it that way. Uh, she's saying that as you know, typically for user research best practices, moderators are trained to like make facial expressions and you don't want to say too much also because it'll affect the audio recording of the participants, mm -hmm. but they, our participants literally can't see us. And so yeah. it helps them if we make those phatic mm, yeah, ah, yeah. like oh that's yeah. interesting and it was interesting also being in the room with six of them the way that they interacted and negotiated yeah. who was going yeah. to talk yeah. Yeah. when they couldn't necessarily get those verbal cues from each other on yeah. who was talking so it was definitely a very interesting experience yeah so by the way I keep talking to people about phatics because I think that we forget in speech or natural language work that we're doing that those noises between us, especially culturally, they're very different between different uh, nationalities. And I think we need to use that as part of why AI natural language would be potentially more interesting. I, um, I think we're concluding here. Uh, we've taken 45 minutes, which I think we have time to potentially address all sorts of potential topics. Um, and yes. I thank you for paying attention. <clears throat> and I'm, really I, I'm gonna to encourage you. everybody, I'm gonna encourage everybody to come back and be visual with us if they can. Uh, and then we can um and we can engage in some questions and answers and you know, more more stuff like that. I think this was very fun and I appreciate it. And uh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, so Indy had a comment in the middle of it <laughs> about the, the design education idea. So we, we, I'm opening the comments not only to the case study, but to the three or four other ideas that Ted and you had uh, thrown okay. out. Okay. Okay. Anybody who wants to participate can, uh, you know, raise your hand. Where am I? Let me see if I can see you raise your hand or just jump in there. Sorry. Well, let's just start with the study. Let's not try and, okay. I would say we try and do the study and then we, we can go back to. But, yes, whatever. I'm kind of off my quiet. There I am. Okay. So yes, we'd be happy to hear from people who have questions or comments about the study. Ted asks, can you, you can't see that. Joy, can you take a few minutes to talk about how you chose this project and maybe how you choose innovative projects in your team? So Ted missed the beginning, I think. But if you want to repeat uh, a little bit. Um, well, I think it's, I, I've had people ask me sometimes in my life, you know, how do you come up with ideas, right? I mean, I know Melissa, I'm sure, has asked me that at some point, right? And other people who work with me. And the simple answer is I have no idea. However, I like to try and come up with answers because no idea is not a particularly great answer. Um, I think it, it, I get annoyed very quickly with things that don't work is the first answer. And then I think, well, can we solve that problem? And in particularly, you know, traveling, getting Lyft and Ubers, I realized that I can't damn, you know, find the car. And then I think, well, what I do like a lot is when I get a message uh, when I'm traveling, I you know it vibrates in my pocket or something, and I think, well, that seems logical. Why can't I have that help me do other things? Vibration is incredibly important to understand what the heck's going on in our life in general, and so I just said, well, why don't we do it for Lyft? Now, no one actually thought I was doing the right thing, and I want to say that not because I'm boasting, but rather more that I'm saying. You have to be determined and you have to then go into some sort of um, stage of mind where whoever tells you it's silly, which has been the story of my life, that you have to come up with a really sensible framework to say it's valuable for my company to do this, right? So I can go back and tell you story after story after story about everyone telling me why everything I've done is the silliest thing ever. But that is what I think um, people don't know, is that if you come up with an idea, you have to have a justifiable 
business direction that's going to be plausible. Now, that means you have to do your homework and think about it and come up with some rationale. You can't just say, hey, I want to build a, a audio vibrating phone because people will go like, and by the way, as you all know, I'm sure, you know, disabilities or impairments do not go well with business directions, which is a very unfortunate thing to say. But I'm just saying that to say you need to think of a better business plan than, well, there's eight million blind people, right? I'm just saying you need to have a generic big business plan, right? So answering Ted a little bit is you have to do your homework to back it up. And how do I choose innovation uh, innovation projects in my team? Well, I ask people to do difficult things. They say I can't do them. And I say, okay, then try harder. I mean, I'm not, and again, just trying to say that people don't try very hard, you know, and I think, I mean, I like telling silly stories as probably all you know, but I remember all my my interns from the design expo I ran for 23 years, people have heard me say, every student has told me they cannot prototype. I've never heard students do anything but say they can't do things, okay? So I remember saying to a student or two students, I remember specifically, I said, they said, well, I, I don't do prototyping. I'm not an industrial designer. I can't do it. I said, well, what do you like doing? He said, I like making baking bread. So I said, then make it in bread. All right. So he did actually prototype the interface in bread. So I think my point is that you can always find out something by using something and everyone has something that they can use for something so he did do it in bread and he put polythene screens on top of the bread that he made and one of the reasons that was nice was it was not rectilinear it was a piece of bread that was like a round shape like a a puck and then the other one was the students in canada did theirs out of pizza boxes right because they had them all around them i said then use a pizza box so people have a limited imagination about what they could use. So that's my point about innovation and choosing projects and people. Okay. Looks like Jeffrey has a question. Uh, and Joy, uh, when you were starting to answer that question, I was thinking about how do I come up with the various ideas for things? I've got a couple of patents and invented a bunch of other stuff. And exactly that, the irritation at things uh, was what came up, which of course is what you said. I sometimes think of it as a metaphor. It's it's like copy editing, right? I mean, copy editing, you're reading somebody's prose and certain things just sort of stick out if you're a good editor. So I kind of think of it as reality editing. Does that resonate for you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think my tolerance for people and things is so low, right? <laughs> like I. I go into stores all the time and realize, you know, why is it there? You know, I remember my other favorite thing, I'm sure many of you do this. I mean, it didn't come from listening to Don Norman, I promise you, but it was, it's things like silly signs, you know, I mean, the one I actually is near my house is called um, the one I took, which now has actually got into the Google image library, apparently, which is the um, psychic cleaner. You know, and it wasn't until my 10 year old son at that time, and I drove past that for probably 12 years, literally 12 years, and I did not see it. And that's another great source of insight, children or people from different cultures. And I thought, he said, mommy, what's a psychic cleaner? And I suddenly looked up. And I go past that all for 10 years. It was a years. round yeah. sign that was divided in the middle. And on the top, it was a psychic. And on the bottom, it was a cleaner. But it looked like one sign because it was a circle. And if you know the basics of design system and visual language, circle means <laughs> together. <laughs> so, But I think that's one thing we learn how to navigate our world by ignoring things that were supposed to be separate by putting them, you know, into one thing, which children, of course, don't see, you know. I mean, I've got hundreds of these pictures. I mean, Melissa now is sensitized to my, quote, sense of humor, if you like. And uh, she sends me silly pictures and so do other people, but they're ridiculous and they're great. They're great and ridiculous. And that's what we all need to have an awareness of to be good designers. I mean, if you don't know how to design things and look at them and you can't see which way's up, 
or what's wrong, then you're probably in the wrong business, in my opinion. There's a question from Carl. Could the driver and passenger phones exchange precise GPS info, maybe down to satellites used through app to give an accurate, rel accurate relative positioning, maybe also allow walkie-talkie mode? So I don't know if it's changed now because it's been three years since the project, but at least when we looked into it then, or I should say Cheng Chao did because he's the one who did the research, um, it wasn't accurate enough um, to get to the precise location where the door is. Yeah. And the example I will use is um, I have find my uh, on my phone with my family. And one time my sister in a panic texted me, why are you at the police station? And I was like, hello, <laughs> I'm eating dinner with my friend at the restaurant next to the police station. <laughs> so I am not, in fact, in the police station. From her perspective, the GPS was saying my location was inside the police station, but it was actually just 10 feet over at the restaurant next door. So that's a, that, that's yeah. at least how the technology was three years. Maybe now it would be different, but that's why we decided to go with. Well, I, I think the point of what we're trying to say is, of course, like now, a year from now or whenever, all the technology will be way cheaper, way lighter, way everything. But what's surprising to me is something as, in my opinion, patently obvious as this hasn't been done. I mean, we, we do it with other technologies, but why can't we get things to work for us in this way why don't companies like i mean not picking on any company but phone companies or whoever use our sensory capabilities we're born with them and we still hammer at visuals all the time when you look at design education we hammer at you know whatever i mean we've got all this capability and we use this you know our eyes for everything you know I mean, there is an image somewhere which i still can't find where they draw the sensory environment around us with this giant finger, usually one big, uh, uh, this finger, what's this called? Index finger. <laughs> and huge eyes, right? And the rest of us is just sort of pathetically whimpering around because we don't use it, right? I mean, think about that as the issue I'm really talking about is we're not doing ourselves any favor by overemphasizing just the visual. And I back to Indy's question, which I'm not really answering properly, but we're not emphasizing the other things that are very important to our understanding of the world. And as we get into these metaverses, hyperverses, whatever, artificial hyper, whatever things, it's going to become even more critical, right? And, you know, I don't, when we try to do the um, phone work, it was incredibly difficult to know how big the range was that we were supposed to use with pulsing. You know, it's it's not known. It's not very easy to get literature on this to say, does does this much mean it or how big a gap or how much, you know, sensory capability should I put into it? We were sort of completely in the blind trying to figure this out, you know. Sorry, in the dark, not in the blind. Sorry, <laughs> my mistake. Sorry. I, I want to think many of our participants had a sense of humor. Yeah, right. <laughs> I want to okay. recognize. I want to recognize Janet Stannon, who's had her hand up for a while. Sorry, sorry, oh, sorry. No, no, that, no rush at all. It's great listening to you. I'm enjoying it thoroughly. Thank you so much for sharing all your uh, learning that you've had with us. Um, it has made me think about when I was listening to one of your uh, respondents talking about the fear of getting into a Waymo and and like in the dark stuff. And I was just thinking, what is the equivalent when I'm thinking of these crews and Waymo cars that are driving around San Francisco now where I am, what is the equivalent that could be a sort of body armor for people who, you know, maybe don't have hearing or sight or, or whatever, maybe we're all gonna need it in the future that could allow us to navigate the world without needing a stick and all the risks of falling off a curb and being hit by a car coming at us as you, head towards your lift ride and getting out of a lift ride. I was thinking, how dangerous must that be for them? You know, how, how do you know when you're yeah. stepping into a traffic? If there's no driver to say, hang on, wait, there's a car coming, you know, how is the Waymo gonna be providing that information for them? Um, and it, fascinating area. You've really made me think tonight. Thank you. Yeah. I have to tell you, I actually really feel, I felt so conscious of this when we were with them. And their bravery and their confidence is unbelievable, just stunning. 
So we, we had another experience. We took the autonomous vehicle to the conference that we, we would gave the talk at. And there was, I don't know, I can't remember now, a few hundred people there that were all blind, right? Range and, of ages. Yeah. I think the youngest was like a six-year-old, seven, yeah, seven-year-old yeah. child. And right. the oldest was, I don't know how old. They and that, that when I was... I was giving part of the talk and just watching everyone's face. They looked like angels looking up at me. Honestly, I was like, I felt really embarrassed, you know, kind of like what they expected me to do something like a trick, you know. Then we took them to the car and it's it's we, got some technology in it. We had an autonomous vehicle prototype, one of Ford's most recent models, and we brought it to them and we left it in the parking lot right. for them to experience. Right. So what, what's interesting is that I think the seven-year-old or something was immediately got in the car, right? And of course, our <laughs> head of technology was immediately panicked, right? And he walked around about an inch away from everything in the car, car like this with his body. And he did basically what I call a spatial map with his body sensing all over him without any technology, obviously. And then there was an older man standing behind him and he's and he went around the young boy went around the whole car and then the older man next to me said when he's older he'll only do half the car and i was like what does he mean and he he suddenly i realized he was making a, a mental map of the whole car but when he gets older he'll know he just needs to do half of it and then he'll make a middle a mental oh. image of the rest of it you know bilateral so three it's the right. way our world works yeah right. and so i was the, and the kids were completely without any fear of learning anything but my tech uh, head was totally worked up <laughs> and i had to say no i think they're okay but he was worried about them pulling plugs or electrocuting things or whatever right so i think we i think we're so fearful but when we know so much and they almost have a fearless and I think that was the glorious thing about that particular project for me realizing they have no choice but to be fearless mm -hmm. anyway I, I would say you're generalizing from a the sample of people who were willing to participate in your study yeah. right I okay. just read that it was and that means I'm, you did I'm great saying. recruiting because you got great feedback right Interesting, I to know that actually, for the first time in their lives, if they were allowed to get in a Waymo and in the driver's seat and just be touching the steering wheel and their car drive, it would be the first time as a blind person you could actually experience what it is to drive a car in a real life situation. It's sort of interesting. Yeah. Hmm. I just thought it was nice that they, I would have been terrified <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So I guess um, I'm trying to see what everyone, anyone else, it's saying I, of course, am impaired here. So, so my Indy, young Indy had, a, Indy, Indy had a comment. Do you want? Are you available now, Indy? Or are you still cooking? <laughs> oh, she's eating. She's uh, eating. Yeah, I'm eating. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Hello. Okay. Cool. Yeah. No, I was just uh, having a comment about the how much uh, the the interface within the cars, especially the EVs, could benefit from haptic because they are so visual. They are so designed as like a giant tablet that you look at and you have to take your eyes off the road when you're driving this, you know, really heavy vehicle down the road. Not great. When are they, when are they going to invest in this? <laughs> well, I think it's like Joy was saying, that's why it's so important to find a good business use case for that because the problem with the screens is it's it saves companies money and effort car companies specifically to just shove everything into the screen because one they can do software updates later mm -hmm. two they save money on the physical switches and when you're a car company you're literally looking at how many grams does this weigh and how many cents does this cost because when you're building hundreds of thousands of these cars it actually ends up adding up to thousands and thousands of dollars. And so it's it's we're fighting against these, these use cases where businesses are like, oh, this is a quick way to save money and to save effort on their part. Um, but I'm hoping that before we reach the point of like total AV, and I think it's gonna be a long time in the future, 
that car companies will rather will actually do their research and look at triaging like what is important and what is high frequent use and how can we make the best and most informed decision about which things should stay physical because they're important to the car function and also to the frequency of the use like the gear shifter to the volume button as we all know we are all constantly touching the volume button and maybe the hvac as power as well um but and then yeah you can you, screens are great they're useful for some some of our features uh but maybe not all of them yeah well they also get smeary that's what oh. i don't like oh and then when the sun hits mm. the screen and you like get blinded <laughs> and you can't see the road <laughs> yeah so i think by the way Indy, we've never actually met, I think, but I would be delighted to talk more about this education topic because it's a very big one. And um, I don't want to, again, start a topic I bore everyone with, but during the Design Expo over 23 years, uh, a couple of huge observations is that America's losing its edge. And I'm very concerned that we need to be trying not to just educate foreign students because they give American universities lots of money but we need to actually think about um, keeping our American talent as well I know I'm not American but let's just pretend I am for the sake of the conversation but I do believe that we started losing it about 15 years ago and the, the writing was on the wall and no one paid any attention mm -hmm. and I think it's it's very unfair because I do believe the aesthetics and the culture of different countries is incredibly important to learn from. I also believe that the um, architecture, et cetera, is important to change your understanding of aesthetics when you grow up. And I think that has also informed so many of the great um, designers. Um, and I mean, John Mider or someone just comes to mind when I say that, but I just wish that we could do something, but people are not in investing in the right ways in education. I mean, just tell me why at this point, interaction designers are still not taking an audio class or a haptics class. And I know that, for example, Aaron Malone and I have talked about this before, and we hope that we can change this even at CCA, right? But it is crazy. Well, we're teaching sound and, and haptic stuff. So um, Sorry? I said we are teaching sound and yeah. haptic stuff, but I think we're a minority. Correct. Correct. I agree, Erin. I'm not criticizing CCA. I was just saying it's crazy that it's not better done, right? I want to recognize. Uh, did you want to say something, Erin? Nope. Just thumbs up. I agree with you, Joy. Cool. Yeah, I want sorry, to I, Melissa, the other Melissa G, who has a comment. Well, first of all, thank you so much. I, I work with physical products and, uh, you know, I've been working on improving our alerts and accessibility and a lot of inspiration from uh, what you've talked about tonight. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Um, thank also, you. my Human Factors program has a multimodal and haptics uh, class. And I had actually uh, emailed the professor who teaches that about this tonight. Cause I, but it's like, she's on East Coast time, but I thought it was like, oh, you might like this talk tonight. <laughs> so uh, oh, I was spreading the word. Good, um, thank you. But finally, like the, the recent John Wick movie, there was a, a blind assassin and he was like using these uh, movement sensing doorbells and putting them throughout this uh, combat zone and they were like alerting him to the enemies coming up so he could like you know go at them with a sword and it sort of made me think I was like oh you just need some of those doorbell devices to be activated on on car doorknobs uh by the ride shares if they know someone needs them <laughs> a, a little less violent solution but <laughs> that's great yeah I mean there's so much potential you could even put um, haptic uh, technology in the seats or other pl other places in the car, mm. um, which would be very exciting. Mm. Yeah. By the way, I just get back to Jeffrey Perone. I think that's how you say your name. Um, 
what's interesting is there's a whole bunch of um, after, I was going to say after effects, that's not the right word, I mean. Well, there's a lot of laws and stuff about noise pollution, first of all. <laughs> you wonder why only the ice cream truck is the one that's allowed to <laughs> play its obnoxious music, but there's, there's actually a lot of laws um, in the U.S. about um, audio that cars are or are not allowed to um, play. Um, and then also in the situation where you're at an airport and there's 10 AVs lined up, um, if they're Ooh, all playing yeah, yeah. music and they're all from the same company, now that would be a challenge. Now we could talk about like yeah. unique yeah. audio signature signatures that maybe you could <laughs> say, but it would... <laughs> Yeah, and, and then there's also laws about the engine noise that cars yeah. need to make, which is also a concern because most AVs prototypes right. are actually right. electric vehicles yeah. or hybrids or something of the like. And for for our case study, this would be a problem yeah. um, because they yeah. rely on the audio of the, you know, we all know when an RV car is being raced around by a child. Um, you can tell it's like... Or like a drone in the air, we know like, oh yeah, it's speeding up, it's slowing down and all those things. But Well, I think I have a slightly different take on some of this because, for example, um, I don't know if people remember when the Mustang um, Marquee came out. Melissa and I were both at Ford at that time and it the sound sounded like a vacuum cleaner, right? <laughs> so it, most people who know the Marquee or a must, let's say, the sorry, the Mustang, Think of it going rum, 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 you know, like that, whatever. I'm trying to pretend I'm a car, which I'm probably not very good at. But they wanted it to be more, dare I say, gruff and rough and all that, right? They've changed it now, okay? However, I think that was, um, we didn't, we should have been sort of sued for not, for using the name incorrectly. Uh, a Mustang doesn't sound like that. However, the other thing that's happened is um, that Harman, particularly the car um, audio company, or the people that put a lot of audio systems into cars, are doing um, specialized sound sources now, so that you can make a, a Ford sound like a Lamborghini, or you know whatever car you want, you can get the sounds pre-processed and put them in your your car. So um, you can, in a sense, lie with your car. Um, and I think it's kind of an ethical question here. Uh, is that the right thing to do or is it allowed? So they have these track meets now with cars that you can do a whole sound source, which is all based on Star Wars. So all the Star Wars cars meet, you know, down the street on the track and go around sounding like, you know, I guess Yoda or something, I don't know. but. It, it's an interesting idea that, you know, what is ethically allowed by designers? Now, if, you know, Coca-Cola suddenly became orange and blue, they would sue. So what do we do when it's a sonic variation of something? I am finding this an interesting question because I think designers will have to have lessons in audio ethics as well as visual ethics. And I don't believe anyone's been teaching that yet. But that's a, a sort of conundrum to me because I'm not sure. It's the same as someone I heard on NPR the other week was talking about when you see a photograph of a, a food in a restaurant, is that the food that you actually will be ten, potentially be able to get? Or is it just some random picture of tiramisu? And mostly they're sort of random pictures of tiramisu. They're not actually the, the food that you're actually going to get. So then you're picking up cars. Are these random sounds that you get or they're actually the car of the, the, what you're going to buy? And mostly, by the way, you know that cars are made of recycled material. So they're not new cars. They're made of old materials that are now recycled, right? So what is a new car? And what is the sound of that car supposed to be? I think there's six sounds, is it, that you have to now have your car make that's an EV or an AV? Or well, that's what is written into the code. Whether they're, whether they're going to do it yet, I don't know. No, I don't mean the code, the software. I mean the codes <laughs> of the uh, interpretation. Like po policy and, and standard. Yeah, policy. Are, are yeah. the, uh, so are the six sounds uh, in that code, whatever the policy yeah. or standard is, are they 
assign to meanings each one. Yes. Or, yes. I, so there are yeah. six specific sounds, each one yeah. having a different meaning. Okay. Yes. Different meanings. Yep. I don't, by the way, I don't do cars anymore. All right. So about two years out of date. So. Yeah. Okay. Listen, Indy, or, so, Indy had to leave. I, she was, uh, yeah, she had to drop off. And Aaron said, or somebody else, Aaron, you talked about cars, EVs with cats and the cats being cats. injured. Yeah. Yeah, my, well, vet, my my vet had told me that that they had seen a ride when the um particularly Priuses because they are so quiet yeah. that yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a rise, particularly with cats in injuries and, and leg injuries and broken legs and things because you know cats like to lay in the road in the sun and they wouldn't hear the cars coming. And yeah. so they wouldn't, you know, run out of the way. Whereas with a normal car yeah. and the engine, they would, you know, have some advanced warning. Um, so, you know, there's definitely, uh, positive yeah. to having some noise. Yeah, I agree. So the only thing I'd like to say about that, by the way, Melissa mentioned it in passing that, um, in Taiwan, they use, um, uh, what is it? Sampro Verde, I forget the Latin word for it now, Beethoven for arrival of the, um, garbage. garbage. So I, I um, find that a little disturbing and I don't think. Beethoven would be super happy about realizing that he's announcing garbage trucks coming. So I think there's a big um, ethics question here, by the way. I know some of you are laughing. I did laugh when I heard it too, but I'm just saying it's an interesting question. You know, so one day it'll be let it be, you know, be cars, you know, garbage truck coming with let it be or hey, Jude, you know, I don't know. Yeah, autonomous vehicles definitely create almost a sensory overload. I know while Joy and I were working on autonomous vehicle experiences, I'm looking at Soyun's comment yeah. um, about audio serving other tasks than notifying, informing people. Yeah. There's just so much that could be going on between the AV communicating with, potentially with other AVs or even pedestrians. Cause you know, pedestrians, they look for the, to make eye contact with the driver when they're crossing the street. There's no driver to look the, into the eyes of so how do they know that they can trust the yeah, av yeah, yeah. um and we i remember we tried to literally map out almost yeah. on like a timeline what all could be happening like the 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 people in the av yeah. could be yeah. um trying to say something to the av like maybe they want to update their location of drop off maybe they're listening to music maybe they're talking to each other maybe they're listening to something going on outside of the av um, there's so much potential for audio to serve as uh, a way to enhance the experience but if we're not careful yeah. and what i think we're starting to run into now because of lack of regulation and maybe we're just it's turning into sensory overload and it's just becoming an, oh that like ev engine noise is so annoying to me and i want to turn it off and versus you know actually being very intentional right, and right. learning ethics and really thinking through the holistic experience and how audio can really booster that instead of taking over so the only thing you talk about and remember is how awful the audio was right so and that it's a very similar to the problem of medical devices and every one of them wants to make its own beep and yet here you are if you've got two people in a room how much audio can you even track to know what the status of the, each of those people is for yeah. all different devices i mean it's too much information not well presented yeah. right i remember Wimo did a very interesting case study on the audio ambiance of the vehicle experience inside so if you i think if you look up i don't know if it's, they still have a dedicated website for it mm -hmm. but i'm sure if you look up on youtube like waymo audio um welcome sequence yeah, or yeah, experience yeah, yeah. like you can still find the the research that they yeah, did I forgot that. about that yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you see people who are getting old forget so um the other thing i got interviewed when i got my job at Ford to discuss the horn of the future. And I think, I mean, if you think about horns, they're unbelievably not evolved. Just, you know, I think we've had that for ages. 
And what would it be? Should it be a tune-like thing? And why is it not a tune-like thing? Because I think we looked into this too, right? Where we couldn't understand whether it was limited or who controlled horns and whether you could play a whole tune or not. I think you can buy a few tunes, but I don't know. We, we looked into it for a small amount of time because we didn't know what the rules were. I imagine we all had our own signature tune. Yeah, or you could be more sophisticated, like right. politely, like yeah. the light tune green, right. <laughs> instead of like, <laughs> right. right. There's no right. sophistication. Yeah. There's no variance. I think we could modulation. Just, yeah, yeah. Well, it could be um, a way of um, saying, you know, I really don't like you. I mean, that's another problem. You could get into all sorts of language that's through this, the audio. You know very unpleasant sounds and nice sounds like, you know, wolf whistles or whatever you want to call them, right? Oh, yeah. I, I don't know, but this is, I mean, why haven't we done these? I don't know, because people don't care about sound. They do, because people listen to audio music all the time, right? I don't know. Yeah. So are there any other questions? I'm looking at it. Somebody invented the go light. <laughs> um, yes. Ted said he mentioned haptics in the seat of a mail truck. Yeah. Drivers aware. So we did. We did haptics also for autonomous vehicles. We did it in the in the, the back here, right? Mm -hmm. And we do have in a Lincoln, if I remember correctly. Ford. This is that the company I used to work for. They had it in the butt, right? They had something. Yeah. Lincoln was like the yeah. high end right, right. car that yeah. Yeah. Ford produces, and so they get the funding for the fancy speakers and the right, fancy right. chairs and the fancy right. like they. I remember they were even doing research on each person getting their individual like speaker so right. that they could individually listen to their music. Um, right, and we did we did a bunch of work on ducking for example, okay. which actually was to do with individualizing the sound space for that ducking, oh, yeah. which is when you transition audio between left and right and people and not people, you know, you can say, well, Lizzie gets hers, I get mine. Right. How quickly does it transition between her and me or whatever? But the other thing that you have, I believe if I'm right, there was over 30, something very high, like 27 actual speakers in a Lincoln. It was extremely high. Probably. I was just blown away. Sorry? Yeah, I said, but, wow, wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, very high. I mean, it's not just for the seats. It's all around the front and all around the back. So you can make literally an encapsulated stereo, quadraphonic, whatever it's now called, sensorama, um, which we're, I'm, we have a room here at um, SAP that's a sensorama with speakers all around you. And it makes for a really, really amazing audio feeling you literally just want to sit there forever especially if you listen to something as old as dark side of the moon <laughs> sorry um, but it definitely like i mean the lincoln was perfect yeah. for innovation because yeah. they already had the physical devices in the car we didn't have to fight right, for right, it right. we didn't have to argue with anyone yeah. about it literally they were asking like designers to come up yeah, with yeah. innovative features right. that they can then market to users and it'll be interesting right. when the world turns into all the sci-fi movies and you can, there's sensors everywhere. And, you know, we could talk about privacy, but let's pretend that everything is good. Um, once the world around us has all of these capabilities, it'll be really interesting to see how designers can change and adapt. And But if you listen to, I mean, I've been in the Lucid before it was actually shipped uh, a few years back. And what was surprising is I asked to talk to the audio people and they said, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, this, how much is the Lucid? It's about 160,000, I think. I don't know. It's a very expensive car, right? And, you know, you would think they had an audio guy, but at that point where it was being, it was a prototype then, they didn't have an audio person, but I'm sure they eventually hired at least one, I would hope. They have nice audio speakers, but they usually just go to Harman and say, put speakers in. They don't think about the experience of designing in that space for an experience for you or me or the team then there. So for example, if you wanted to hold meetings in a car, that would be a normal thing. I mean, a relatively normal thing to do, especially when you, when we did work on Teslas, for example, some people, although I'm not saying this is what you should do, would say, we want to test us so we can drive and work from Palo Alto to Los Angeles. 
And they specifically, in those days, very few people had Teslas. They bought them specifically to drive to LA so they could basically work, which meant they put them on, um, what do you call it? Auto mode, right? Autopilot. Autopilot, right. It's not the right word to describe. But anyway, they did that, right? And so if you think of meetings, you need different types of audio, especially microphones for um, meetings. Let me read. Absolutely, okay. Okay. Ted says to everyone, I'm not everyone, Ted, so I can't answer. <laughs> he says some good talks happened a few months ago. Is there something you're implying, Ted? <laughs> that you had good talks in this? He was um, talking about the workshop that uh, Greg oh, okay. Heiden spoke with us about last month or two months ago, and it was uh, called the the website is the okay. future of no, excuse me um is from the trace oh, sorry interface.org right. slash right. future of interface right so, trace center so you might want to you know it would be good to get those folks together with the uh, car design folks right yeah yeah we don't do cars anymore by the way but I know I'm really I happy know. what do we do now it's a good question. I'm just paid to talk about things. <laughs> yeah. Stuff, yeah, stuff and the uh, bits and things. Remember? Things and stuff, <laughs> right. Anyway, um, I, Melissa and I don't work together anymore either. So this is a big treat for us to be, let's say, on camera, which we'd love to be in person. I mean, actually see people and say hello. Well, that, that's a wonderful transition, I think, for us to be able to say next month, we hope to see all of you and each of you bring a friend who didn't know Richard, because we're going to tell you about our good friend, Richard Anderson, who unfortunately died last spring and who was a terrific contributor to Bakai and really gave Bakai its personality, I think. Is that a fair statement yeah. from those of us yes. who are old timers here? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So injected a bit of humor. But took things seriously. And thank you for hosting us. And um, we look forward to meeting in person. Uh, we believe that SAP will host you next time. We're just settling on this precise location because we have so many opportunities of locations. <laughs> but it will be um, in uh, Palo Alto. Let's just be clear, right? Exactly. Exactly. So that's fun and delightful to see you both. And uh, Melissa, nice to meet you. And I, I almost am being able to tell you apart from joy at this point now that we've been <laughs> together for a while, right? Glasses, right? Now we got the same. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard, but I'll I'll keep working on it. I hope. It's my Everybody accent. Else? <laughs> oh, is that it? That's your accent. Thank you all for showing up tonight. And we hope to see you next month and in the future again. Uh, it's the first in-person meeting since COVID-19 next month, as Ted remarks. And so we'll see everybody soon. Susan Wolf, who's visible here, will be part of the organizing team for the Richard Remembrance. And okay. see you then. Okay. Thank you. Thank see you, you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.